Mm -hmm. All right. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, sorry it's a little wet, but we are in Southwest Alabama. We should all be used to this by now. Um, but it's great having everyone here in our United Way of Southwest Alabama and South Alabama Coalition of Nonprofits efforts to share educational opportunities and trainings as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So today we have a panel that will be discussing more about supporting and serving those living with disabilities. And so of course we have to highlight our very own Brad Martin and, and Chantel Black that works on the team at United Way of Southwest Alabama. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brad to uh, finish up those introductions and get the session going. So Brad, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. I'll start by asking, do I need to tilt my camera? Because you know, I can't see myself. You look great. Okay. I didn't want you to see like the top of my head because that's not very good. Um, thank you. I appreciate uh, everyone being here. Um, again, we're going to talk about serving people with disabilities, and I'll tell you what got me started on that topic and thinking we needed to do this. We started getting on our community resource network, Listserv, people would send flyers with their information, and um, it would say things like, join us for our next upcoming event, the details are attached. And because it was a flyer, it was basically a picture. So I would open the flyer. And I don't know if either Leslie or Trista, if you have um, the document that I sent you this morning, but I was going to show what happens is it's if it's a picture like a JPEG, the computer cannot read it. Um, it is not text. And so it's it would be as if I handed you a Polaroid of a phone and told you to call me with it, right? It's not really a phone. These are not really words. And so you can, if you have the right software, you can attempt to get the computer to show you what is in the picture or what is on the screen. And it will do its best to do what the human eye does and the human brain does, which is to interpret that image. And so if either of you has that document where you can screen share the first page, I'll show you what happened when I opened a JPEG that I asked Leslie to send me. Trista looks like she's sharing. And as somebody can try to read page one and see if we can make any sense of it. And it, we won't laugh at you. I probably, well, we might, but it, it, it'll be in good fun. Somebody try and read that. Well, Starts with an X. Brad, they have a, a cheat sheet because how my screen showed it is, is showing both pages. Yeah, if you change it to editorial view, it'll show to one page at a time, but otherwise it's going to get... And it's fine. You, you can see, though, the first page, what happened is it came out jibber-jabber right? And, you know, the X, by the way, at the very top, that's because, you know, the little X that you click on to close the window, it saw that as part of the picture. So you got an X and then you got a bunch of blah, 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 blah. And it's, it's all run together and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And sometimes the PDFs, which is, I copied the text that showed up in the PDF as page two, but sometimes the PDF will say, this document appears to be empty. It may be malformed or it may need OCR. And so I, I, I bring that up to say, I realize people don't realize when they send out communications to the masses that people who are reading them may not be able to get the information they're trying to put out. And that led me to a greater picture of understanding we need to have a conversation in general about how we as nonprofits serve people with disabilities to the best of our ability and give people the services they need and the accommodations they need to take advantage of them. And so that's where this all started from. Um, and so I, I put together a panel of people with some disabilities. I should point out there are many disabilities. Some you can see, some you cannot. So um, you know, having a debilitating disease can be a disability. Um, having cancer can be a disability. Um, having dyslexia may be a disability that may prevent someone from reading your intake paperwork. And these are not necessarily things that you can see. Some disabilities are things you can see. It's pretty obvious if someone is in a wheelchair that they're in a wheelchair. Um, most people who are blind, it's 
usually pretty easy to tell. We're usually using either a cane or a guide dog, or if we don't have either with us, a lot of times you can tell we may not be looking at you. Um, in my case, my eyes may be closed. So some things you can see, some you cannot. What I will say is as a panel, we do not represent all disabilities, nor do we represent everyone who has the disabilities that we have. And what I mean by that is some people who are blind read Braille, some do not. Some use a computer, some do not. Um, for people who are deaf, uh, some may read lips and the assumption is, oh, deaf people read lips. So not necessarily. And so it is important to know, tip number one for the day, that it would be a good idea to not be afraid to ask people what they need to be supported or to be helped. Um, it is okay to say, how may I assist you or tell me the best way to help you um, to do whatever it is that you're, you're asking them to do. Um, we would prefer that to people assuming that they know what it is we need and trying, I mean, people mean well, they really do. But sometimes our assumptions get in the way of, of, the, of the good. And so it's okay to ask and it's okay to, um, to let the person who is uh, the, living with the disability lead on those types of things. Um, so I wanna introduce our panel. Um, and I will start by, by telling you I am Brad Martin, as you've heard. I am the program coordinator for our volunteer income tax assistance program. And uh, I also help manage our Volunteer Connect database for managing and recruiting volunteers. Um, I am old enough, and I only tell you this because it's relevant. I am old enough. I'm 47. So I'm old enough to remember when there was no Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I was born in New Orleans, but I moved here when I was eight. I attended Baker Elementary, Middle, and High Schools with support from the Regional School for the Deaf and Blind. Um, and then I went to Spring Hill College and went and got a degree in broadcasting. Don't even ask me how I got into taxes because it's nothing like broadcasting. But um, So the point being that um, I've been blind my whole life. And I remember when the ADA first came out and everyone said, oh, it's going to fix everything. It was going to be wonderful. And it has definitely improved a lot of things. Is it perfect? I don't necessarily think so, but that's just my opinion. I think it's done wonderful things and things have gotten so much better. Um, I remember when when I would, would go to a restaurant and people would ask the people I was with what I wanted to order. And now people know to talk to me. So we're making headway but um, there's always room for improvement. So that's my story in a nutshell. I now wanna introduce um, Chantille Black, who is, um, well, I'll let her tell you what she does with us and she works in our offices as well. Chantille? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Chantille Black and I'm the COVID coordinator at the Clark County Outreach Center in Grove Hill. At the age of 17, I was involved in a car accident that left me with a spinal cord injury and also a minor head injury. And as a result of that accident, I use a wheelchair for my mobility. I graduated from Jackson High School in 2016. And then I went on to Coastal Alabama Community College where I graduated with my associates. And a few months after graduating, with the help of the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and Customized Employment Solutions, I was able to get a job working with United Way. Okay. which is awesome. We're glad to have you. And I'm so glad that Chantille at, uh, agreed to do this presentation with us because um, she brings a lot of different perspectives. She's a lot younger than I am, for one thing. So she has a different perspective on disability. She is someone who encountered her disability later and not wasn't born with it. So we're very opposite in a lot of ways. And so I think we bring different perspectives. Um, and I appreciate you being here. Fred, have, has Fred gotten on the line yet? He is one block away. He'll be here soon. Sorry, okay. Brad. Okay. Okay. Well, we will get back with him. Tell him not to hurry. We don't want him. To, we want him to drive safely. We will come back with Fred. Fred is. Uh, Fred is with the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, and he is um, a case manager for the deaf. And Fred and I have worked together because um, United Way does taxes uh, for the clients who are deaf at the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind. And so Fred and I have come to work together and, and that's always funny. We always laugh that, or I do anyway, that 
growing up in school, they they put you in school with the deaf and blind, and we're completely opposite. We can't we can't. It's hard for us to communicate, right? I can't see anyone who's signing, and they can't hear anything I'm saying. So, um, growing up as kids, we we kind of struggle with that a little bit. Now that we're adults, and there are things like Facebook, it's a whole lot easier. And a lot of the kids I went to school with, now that I'm 47, I can communicate with them. So, um, technology is certainly making things better in that regard. Um, so what I will do is I will start with a couple of topics and um, Chantil and I will start with, with what we know and then we'll of course invite Fred to continue as well. Um, and I just lost the page of notes that I had. So give me just a second. <laughs> the, the joys of live TV, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on two computers. It's all good. Almost there. There we go. Um, so the first thing I, I thought I would talk about um has to do with serving clients with disabilities on the daily like you know um i'll give you an example of what we do and how it changes if someone is 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 living with a disability um and the irs has checks to make sure that we are following these types of rules i'll tell you that i was on a committee to write the site coordinator handbook for the volunteer income tax assistance program. And when we got to the chapter, I won't say chapter, we got to the section on disabilities, there was a paragraph or two. And basically it said, make sure you have handicapped parking and make sure that you have wheelchair ramps so that people can access your site. And that was kind of the extent of it. And I said, no, th this is not this is not good. And so um, I wrote a chapter. And um, so I learned a lot. I interviewed people with different disabilities before I wrote it and I learned a lot. And um, I think it's made me a better public servant um, to know what I know and I'm happy to share it. Um, so when we have someone come in, the first thing they have to do is complete a four page intake form. Oh, wow. um, how do we deal with that? um with our tax program so if someone is blind if we know they're blind before they come in um we will offer if they if it would help them to email them the form which is a fillable electronic pdf and it is accessible um if they if we don't know they're blind before they come in or if they are not a computer user then we will make a volunteer or a staff member available to read the information to them and fill out the paperwork for them um, it sounds like a minor thing, but it is something to keep in mind that we we are a very intake related industry. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's like going to the doctor's office. Um, sometimes you just you need somebody who's going to write that paperwork up. Um, when we go over a tax return, the normal thing that people do with people who can see is to point out different things. This is your adjusted gross income. This is your um, your your standard deduction. These are your, these are your deductions. These are your credits, and this is your final. And we usually point those out. And obviously, for someone who can't see, um, we have to we need those read to us. So it's just little things that make a big difference. Um, so what I would say next, Chantil, if you were going into an organization have you ever encountered and we did i did a video on this when i was in college of someone who was in a chair trying to get into a building that was not accessible to them remember i came along before the ada so it was a bigger problem in the 90s than it is now but do you still run into that yes i do i mean there are a lot of places especially where i stay that it's not it's not accessible for me so i 
I always have to find a, another way to get in. Or if I can't get in, then that means that I can't go there because I can't get in. And so it's really hard a lot of the time. And then like, especially if I don't have like my mom or dad, like to, like sometimes to help me, then it's definitely even harder because I, I need help sometimes getting in and out of different places that aren't handicap accessible. And do you find that even once you get in, um, sometimes the room where you're supposed to go maybe not may not be accessible. Um, you know, we we have a, cl a few clients who come into the tax centers in wheelchairs, and in one of the buildings, um, we have an office that's large enough to accommodate the person, and this person needs somebody to actually push them and whatnot. So we use the biggest office we have to make sure there's enough space. In another building, we actually borrow a conference room because the office spaces that we have are very small. And so it, it sort of is incumbent upon us as the organization uh, providing services to make our services accessible to you somehow, whether that is a different room or meeting you in a different spot. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things we try very hard to do. Um, so as for those of you listening to this, as you think about your space and you think about clients, um, coming in to see you, what barriers can you envision that we as people with disabilities might run into? And you don't have to answer this publicly. I'm just telling you to think to yourself. And if you want to address any particular questions to us on this topic, I'm happy to, to entertain those. But just think to yourself, what kind of barriers do you think your organ your your space or your policies or procedures might present and do you have ways to work around them um and again I'm not calling anybody out certainly not I just think that people don't know until we bring it up um but yeah. regarding that is somebody saying something I heard a voice um does anybody have any questions uh, that we can answer to help you think through that process what would I you know what if what if situations or um things that maybe you're not sure how we would accommodate or how you would accommodate something that we would need. Is there anybody who has any questions about that? And I tell people in my classes, don't raise your hand because I won't see you. Brad, I will share that Fred has joined us. Oh, great. Welcome, Fred. Um, I'm glad you're here. And um, I was going, we, we just briefly talked about um, who I am, who Chantil is. So now if you'll tell us a little bit about how uh, you got into this work or, or whatever you want to share about your, um, your situation with us, um, I'd be glad to, to have you as a part of the uh, discussion. doesn't have his camera on oh i'm i'm not sure he's quite ready to participate brad he's got gotcha. you interpreter not a, oh i got you <laughs> no no he, he had no his, apologies no this is great uh, this is he, this is all part of the process right right um, he um he thought we were starting at one. Oh no <laughs> my bad um <laughs> So, so yeah, so okay. Give him, I got give him just a second, okay? <laughs> sure, no problem. Okay. No problem. Tell him don't stress. Don't stress. Don't stress. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> Life is too short to stress. I ask a question um, of Chantil. You were saying that you were working with the Alabama Department of Rehabilitative Services, and that is how you got connected with the United Way? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so might that be an avenue for us to pursue, um, like broadening our range of applicants when we are looking to hire for certain positions? Yes, ma'am, I would say so, it would be. I would agree. Um, Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services has 
uh, job coaches and counselors for all sorts of different um, disabilities. There's a blind caseload and there's a deaf caseload and whatnot. And they have folks who are looking to place folks. So yes, I would definitely say that can be a source of, of employees uh, and, and job applicants. I would agree with that. And thank you. Uh, and Diane, um, ADRS partners a lot with um, like Goodwill and uh, VOA. They also provide those customized employment solutions or customized employment programs. Thank you. And I'm I will say that also that the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind has done some of that too, because I know I've worked with, um, just in doing taxes, we've used, um, we've had help from some of the job development folks who also know how to sign, um, acting as sort of interpreters for us in the past. So, um, you know, again, any organization, a lot of these organizations that work with people who are disabled, part of that function is employment, and certainly ADRS qualifies for that. But, you know, um, people who are disabled often are the most underemployed. Um, yeah. I, I know a lot of blind people who don't necessarily work and, um, you know, that's, that's the challenge I was going to get into as well in a little bit, but, um, yes. So again, all of those things are possibilities. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump done, but thank you're you good. for answering my question. You're good. Thanks, Diane. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to move to another topic. This is not a question, Mr. Martin, but rather I am going to put in the chat in just a second, if I can, a PDF link, a link to a PDF that lists the contact information for ADRS all around the state. Oh, fantastic. So a question, and I'll, and again, we can come back to any of these topics, but I'm just going to tell you, a question that people often ask me is, does it bother you <laughs> when people ask you how you do things? And I don't necessarily mean job-related things. I mean, um, you know, it can be job-related. How do you use a computer if you can't see the screen? Because most people, their frame of reference is in order to use the computer, you have to be able to read it. Uh, but also, how do you do things like how do you how do you get dressed in the morning? How do you know what color you're wearing? How do you know if those colors match? Um, do you cook? No, I don't, but I know plenty of blind people who do. Um, you know, just things like that. No, it does not bother me. Um, I tell people all the time, my disability is something I'm not ashamed of. I don't hide it. It's kind of hard to hide it. Uh, I'm very open about it, but it does not define me as a person. So um, I would rather that people get those questions answered and and then, you know, be able to move on beyond that point and see me the whole person. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is, do you dream? Do you see in your dreams? No, I don't because I've never had vision. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I have blind friends who who had vision at one time. And yes, they can see in their dreams. And I have all kinds of questions about that as well, but um, in that I think are fascinating. But basically, no, it from my from my perspective, it does not bother me for people to ask those types of questions because people are innately curious. And if I don't tell you, you'll never know. And um, I think it helps to move beyond that point once those questions get answered. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess to kind of piggyback off of you, Brad, I mean, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me either. I mean, because like you said, I would rather for people to ask questions than to wonder. So I do, and I do get asked a lot with me being in a chair. And so, no, it doesn't bother me because I, I mean, I don't mind telling you as, and I would rather for you to ask them and really stare and just like, you know, make assumptions. So it doesn't bother me either when people ask certain questions. And you bring up a really interesting point, Chantil, because you talk about people staring. And I've heard that from other people. See, that's the thing blind people don't always know, is that people are staring at us in odd ways because we can't see it. But for mm -hmm. other people, I have heard that, that people just sort of stare at you like, you know, and it's it's probably as much because 
whatever they're seeing is outside the ordinary for them. Yes. Um, but some people become very self-conscious about it. Um, and so, you know, that's an interesting point that you use that phrase, because I know a lot of people have told me the same thing and, and people probably stare at me too. And I just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. So. Hey, Brad, I have a question. Yes. This is Brian for my or you mentioned earlier, um, about when we're sharing flyers and how you have difficulty reading them, especially if they're a JPEG, uh, a lot of the organizations around here convert their PDFs into JPEGs, especially on social media. Yes. What are some best practices for us in order to reach a wider audience? Um, I've seen some people, like for example, as an image, you would describe it via text in the same post. Um, yes. What do you um, recommend? So there is apparently a feature, I'm not, Leslie may, may know more about this than I do, um, where you can, actually enter a description. I've seen the World Institute on Disability do this and they do an excellent job. Um, and they can enter a description that only shows up if the image doesn't load, which the computer would read to me, but not necessarily visualize to you. Um, I don't know how that works. I really would like to understand that better. Um, it never hurts to just, if you're gonna email a flyer, also include the text somewhere. Um, a PDF can be good, if it's a text PDF, if you've got something that is scanned, it's generally a mess. And if it's got a complicated layout, because what the screen reader tries to do is turn it into a straight paragraph format, almost like you would read an email. So when you've got like text here and then you've got a picture here and you've got some text around the box, it tries to read straight across. Another way to imagine that is if I handed you a newspaper and instead of you knowing, intellectually knowing that you need to read the left column and then the middle column and then the right column, what if you just read straight across? You'd get three stories at once. The computer, if it's not coded and tagged properly, a PDF is kind of a mess in some senses because if you've got different columns of information or you've got information that's kind of scattered, it's gonna try to read straight across unless it is tagged properly to know that it's supposed to read column A, column B, and then column C. Um, some, when in doubt, uh, straight text is always a good thing. I know it's boring and people don't like it, um, but straight text, computers can read ones and zeros that represent letters. When you get to, I don't know if you've seen, have you ever had a Facebook page that the images didn't load properly? And you get interesting things like, um, Facebook will attempt to describe a picture and it might say image may contain shoes and outdoor or image may contain text that says and sometimes the text is perfectly transcribed sometimes it's a disaster and sometimes you just get image may contain text um, and it's because Facebook is getting better at it as as all technologies are but those images are just hard for the computer to interpret, even though your brain does a great job at it. Um, so again, anything that's just straight text, if you're sending an email, um, it doesn't hurt to send even in the body of the message, the, 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 the critical text. Um, and then you can also include the JPEG as well. And we'll know that the text is the important part for us. Um, or you, know, you could even send it in a straight word document, as long as it's like organized text. Where it gets messy is when the text feels jumbled and you saw what happened with this, the scan. Um, and again, you see that with things that are in different columns. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. Uh, what if the post doesn't contain any text? If it's just an image, like two people, would it be beneficial for say, us to- You would describe the image as whatever you want me to know about it. In other words, you can say, you can be as as, as ambiguous as image may contain a house with three trees in front of it, or you, if, if it's important for me to know what kind of trees it is, if I'm reading something about, you know, a certain types of trees, you can be as descriptive in those tags as you want to be. Um, and I really need to find out how they do that, for example, on Facebook. But basically, um, the IRS asked me the same same question, Brian. Uh, we were working on a book together and they said, how much information do we need to include in the screenshot? Because they were showing screenshots of the tax software. And I said, well, how much do I need to know? 
Like if the point you're trying to make is that there's a text box that I need to put information in, I probably don't need to know that the continue button is blue. But if you want me to know that I should be focusing on um, the, if the text says, you know, look for all the red areas, then you need to tell me what's red. Um, so it depends on how much information you want to convey, but just assume that if you don't tell me, I won't know. Um, and I know that's a tough, vague thing to say, but it just is because what happens is that people have sort of gotten used to everyone seeing the way they do. I, I, I'm even guilty of it. We were working in a software that had different colored items. And I said to a volunteer, okay, now what you need to do, and because I teach visually, even though I'm not a visual person, and even though I'm never going to look for something that's in red, I know that my sighted volunteers do. And so I said, you need to look for things that are red. And the guy goes, um, I'm colorblind. And I said, oh, Okay, so I went and got another volunteer to find something red and then said, now, can you, to the volunteer who was colorblind, can you see something else about it that looks different? Is it underlined? Is there some other defining attribute? And so, you know, we, we tend to think everyone thinks the same way and they just don't and they, they don't function the same way. So if it's critical information, just share it as text. Everyone can pretty much get that text. Um, <laughs> And it never hurts to have the picture as well. Mm -mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. By the way, I then asked a second volunteer about the color, the red thing. And he said he was colorblind too. I said, two in one day, what are my odds? Um, we had a good laugh over it, but um, we did find a solution. So. Um, so. The, there's one question I'm asked a lot is, are there things that people do that you wish they wouldn't do in terms of people with disabilities, people who mean well, but maybe, you know, uh, are doing things that are that are a little more um, invasive or, or, or not necessarily offensive, but not what you would prefer. Um, the most common one I hear from people, especially who are blind, is don't grab somebody and assume you need to push them in the direction that you want them to go. Um, you know, ask them if they want to take your arm, if they want you to give direction, um, you know, especially someone you don't know, someone who's coming into your office for the first time. It's, it's kind of an invasive thing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let you know if I need, you know, that kind of guidance, but, um, for one thing, vision is, is, is important to balance. And since I have no vision, my balance isn't great. And so if you push me too hard, you might knock me over. Not really, but I mean, it, you, you, it, it can be a little bit, um, tricky to navigate some of those types of things. Chantio, you were telling me about some things that people do and assume they should do. Um, when we talked last week, you want to share a couple of those that, you know, people just don't realize they're doing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, like um, when certain people, when they talk to me, they feel that they have to like bend down and get on their knees so they'll be eye level with me. But I don't really mind like if the person is um is standing, I don't mind them standing and talking to me. They don't have to be eye level with me. And then also like when it comes to pushing, I mean, I don't mind, I don't mind the help at all, but I do like to be as independent as possible. So like instead of just coming up and pushing me, I would I feel would feel better if you ask, hey, do you mind if I give you a push or hey, do you need help? So that's those are really the only two things that um kind of bothers me, but that's it. Yeah. It's gotten a lot better. Um it's gotten a lot better as people have become aware, right? And that's that's the thing. <laughs> As yeah. I said, when I used to go to restaurants, people would go around the table. Okay, ma'am, what do you want to, and what does he want? And I'm like, well, he would like, um, you know, and, and so I think people have become aware of that inclusion on that level. Um, sometimes I still find that I have to interject a little bit, um, but I do it with humor. Um, I don't do it in, a, in an obnoxious or, or offended way. 
Um, but just to get their attention, I'll, I'll make a joke about something completely irrelevant. And they realize I can carry on a conversation. Um, yeah. I would be interested um, if, if Fred, if you're there, um, how you handle that situation or what Hi. that looks like for you. Pardon? Yes. Um, yes. This is um, the interpreter speaking. Um, Fred and I have just joined the meeting. Oh, great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Lisa and I work together as well. Um, so, Fred, what I was asking is we're talking about things that people do that they assume they need to do for you that they may not need to do. And I was talking about my um, <laughs> finding that people will try to ask other people what it is that I would like to eat at a restaurant <laughs> or that kind of thing. Um, and I'm sure people wonder how that works for you if uh, you're trying to communicate with a server and you may not have an interpreter with you uh, at a restaurant. Um, we, were, we, we, we were talking earlier about that and how people wonder how we do things that we do every day that are part of our normal existence. Okay. I don't know if Lisa can okay, hear me. So can you see me? I, yeah, now? I can see okay. you now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. So sorry um, for the mix up, but I'm here and, and glad to be here. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of different approaches to situations. Um, deaf people were all different and different levels of hearing, um, you know, like with vision, you know, there are different degrees of hearing loss. You know, some deaf people can read lips, some cannot read lips. Some cannot hear at all. Some can hear a little bit and some can hear more. We all have our own different preferences. In restaurants, um, most of us typically will just point at the menu um, or we can write or we use our phone and we just text what we want and then we just talk that way. And then sometimes we use just normal gestures. Um, most deaf people are very independent you know, can think outside of the box to try to communicate with a food order. Um, but, you know, um, most people, um, if they need help, like, for example, with involved with um, when having an interpreter, most people typically what they do is they will look at the interpreter and not the deaf person. They just look at the interpreter and we get that feeling of a disconnect because we want to talk to you and you're talking to me as a deaf person. Don't look at the interpreter. It's just the interpreter's like a bypass for communication. They're just relaying the information back and forth. And we really depend on eye contact as deaf people. I'm always looking at the interpreter and the hearing person at the same time. But when hearing people won't look at me and they only look at the interpreter, I feel left out or I feel like I can't make a decision that everyone's relying on the interpreter to make all the decisions. The interpreters don't do that. Um, so that, but that's just how we feel. That's just how deaf people can sometimes feel. So when you're with an interpreter and a deaf person, look at the deaf person. That's very key uh, information, very critical for us. Just look at the deaf person. Um, another thing, People will say, and it's really unfortunate, um, and I'm sure low vision um, people may have this too, but they will say, can you drive? And it's just, yes, we drive. We have a driver's license. Um, we see the ambulance down the street coming in our mirrors. We see the pullover. Um, and now um, with the smartphones, we even get notifications if there's a bad accident or if there's bad weather approaching, and we know in advance. And so we have that information. Um, a lot of people think, you know, oh, you can't hear on the phone. Oh, we have video phones now. And so we see the interpreter on a screen and we can just talk to anyone just like a normal conversation. People don't realize that they're talking to us through an interpreter on the phone. But there's just so much amazing technology out there now um, in the community. So I'm trying to think of some other questions that people ask. I do know I've caught Brad and Chantel talking about uh, pushing, giving people giving you a push. Um, sometimes um, with deaf people, it's okay if I don't hear you. Obviously, I can't hear you calling my name. Just a light tap on the shoulder to get my attention on the shoulder only, not on the back, and very light catch 
Also, you can flip the lights on and off. Um, but deaf people with hearing loss, um, you know, we also have bad balance. We have really awful balance, you know, because our hearing, we can't hear. So sometimes our balance is off and I'm very easy to fall over sometimes. So our <laughs> balance is off too. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, those, um, those are typical questions. And then, you know, Fred, oh, and, I'll tell you one of the things that I was saying earlier, I think before you got here, is that going to school, I was in school with lots of people who were blind and lots of people who were deaf. And it's so funny because people tend to put those two together because they're both sensory impairments. But we traditionally have had a hard time communicating because you wouldn't be able to necessarily hear me and I wouldn't be able to necessarily see you. Um, but technology, and this is what you're pointing out, has really made a big difference. Uh, and now a lot of the folks that I went to school with 30 years ago, now finally we can talk to each other. Um, and certainly the advent of the smartphone and FaceTime and features like that I've observed even in my limited interactions how that has just revolution, revolutionized things for people who are deaf. Um, it certainly makes things easier for us. Um, and yet there was something that you said there that I want to go back to. And that is you were saying when we were talking about restaurants and you were saying sometimes people write um, information. And yet for some types of interactions I have observed and you probably have as well, particularly things of a complex nature like tax returns, medical reports, where the value of an interpreter is that sometimes in writing things get lost in translation. Would you agree with that? And do you think that's a fair assessment that there are times when writing works in a pinch, but there are there are other resources that we should be utilizing. Hey, Nisha, can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yes, that's funny that you mentioned that about the writing and reading and back and forth. Yeah, I was getting. I wanted to say that too. Yes. Um, really, it just depends on each individual deaf person, but most. Um, I would say 97% of hearing parents have deaf children. 10% of deaf children have deaf parents. So talking about language deprivation, it is huge. 97% of deaf children have hearing parents that they cannot communicate with. So they have just, a, they're very behind in their language capabilities and writing back and forth has, is just a huge impact with many things. For example, just a simple order in a restaurant, um, like Brad mentioned, medication, legal issues, tax issues, um, something important with documentation. It's very important to have an interpreter. Um, you know, have the agency bring in an interpreter to protect your agency, to protect the, the patient or the consumer or the client. Um, because I will say, you know, deaf people will just tend to nod their head like they understand and they really do not. They will just typically nod their head and there's no comprehension of what you're saying. They just want to hurry up and get it over with. And they just trust that you're going to do whatever it is that you're doing for them. They just trust the hearing folks to to, to help them out, but it may not always help them out. It may not be beneficial for them. So it is important to have access to clear communication and have that interpreter in place. And that way, if there's a misunderstanding, you know, you can rephrase something or re-explain something um, for the deaf um, people. Um, you may face um, some deaf people that want to be completely independent um they are very independent and they don't you know they want to do everything themselves that's fine but you know you can always offer do you want an interpreter for that appointment and then you know as and say you know we can get an interpreter for you if they say yes great go ahead and get that interpreter if they say no i don't need an interpreter um that's fine but be prepared have a lot of paper and pen ready 
um, to try to be able to communicate as a backup because there could be misunderstandings in this communication. And I want to share a, a brief incident that happened not getting into specifics I don't even remember who the person is so I'm not naming names but I remember years ago we had a client we were doing taxes for and the person owed not a I don't think it was a lot of money but they owed and they didn't understand why they owed because they had taxes taken out and we explained what the numbers should be and what they were and, and of course we had the benefit of an interpreter and the person said no one's ever told me that before. And they've been filing taxes, um, you know, for a long time. But, you know, that information never got conveyed. They never got to ask those questions and get those answers in a way they understood. And so I was really proud of the fact that we we were able to do that. Um, I also know that things are similar for blind people. When I bought a house, um, I was lucky. I knew my real estate agent um, on a personal level. Um, they had been one of my volunteers at a former job and they were willing to read through as much of that closing documentation as was necessary. Now, if you've ever bought a house, you know, that's a stack of paper. And because I had a trust relationship with that person, I was okay with them sort of explaining in layman's terms what all of that lingo meant. But um, I certainly appreciated the fact that my realtor was willing to read all of that information to me, and that would have taken forever. But we, to, to Fred's point, we have the right, just as anyone else does, to know what we're signing, right? Um, and so it's different. A lot of the things that Fred and I will tell you are kind of opposite for our, our various situations because you do everything the opposite way. Um, for Fred, you, you would want to make it more visual. For me, you would want to make it less visual, right? So, but there are certain parallels and, and that's certainly one of them when you're dealing with sensitive information. What I would ask both of our panelists and you're welcome to comment or not as you see fit, what kinds of things do you think agencies should know about uh, if a client were to come in um, perhaps without an appointment? um and just need assistance with something and understand that we have folks here in the audience who serve all types of situations from children to adults and um you know what types of things do you think it would be important for an agency to know to serve you in the event that you needed assistance you've named a lot of fred's named a lot of good ones um And I can start if you want me to give a push or if you have something, if either of you has something you want to throw in, great. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a couple of things in. Thank you, Brad. Just one thing I would like to add. Um, Brad, mm -hmm. I wanted to add one more thing Fred is saying. Um, while I was waiting for the interpreter to arrive, I was watching your um, communication through the text. And you talked about the social media description of pictures. That is also impactful to the deaf community as well and the deaf blind community because we do rely on those descriptions. It's, I really support really good descriptions of pictures. Deaf people really ask that if you post anything that's spoken on social media, any news or any updates or anything, please add subtitles on the screen because, um, or if you can't just add descriptive uh, information in the box, in the comment box or something, because we would like to know what you're talking about. You know, it's very important to receive that information. If you're only speaking and we can't hear, you know, then we don't know what you're talking about. So it's, it's very important if you could add that information as well. Okay, and Fred your turn. You bring up a good point, Fred, and I want to ask you about this. You said you were watching the captions um, on on the uh, on the webinar. How yeah. accurate are those? I was sitting in a restaurant one day, and I was with a friend who could see, and it was a it was a I think it was a, a sports bar or something. So the sound was turned down, 
And we were reading, she was reading the captions to me. And by the time it was over with, I said, I'm embarrassed. People who are deaf must think we don't know how to talk at all. I mean, the, 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 the grammar was terrible. They, uh, when they did the Star Spangled Banner at the beginning of the game, I thought, well, that those lyrics haven't changed in over a hundred years. Surely those are those are typed in correctly, and they were not. And I was embarrassed. And I'm just curious, <laughs> how accurate now that we're going to all this automated <laughs> captioning, which is what this is, how accurate does it tend to be? Uh, can you see me, Lisa? Um. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, when it comes to live captioning, it is not 100%. I would say it's about at a 70% accuracy. I know some people say, you know, the ums and the hmms, that's important information and it does not pick that up. Also, I've noticed um, between men and women, their voices are different. And sometimes that is not conveyed. Live captioning is not great. Um, TV shows and things like that, the captioning is spot on, except for 2020 or Dateline. Um, it's horrible, horrible captioning for those shows. Um, Brad, I just yes. wanted to say that we are at the seven minute warning and that you also had a question um, yes. from Audra. As an employer, what would what do what would you want companies to know when interviewing and or hiring a person with disability? That is an excellent question that was on my list and I hadn't gotten to yet. I'll let my panelists talk first and then I'll I'll contribute last because I've been doing a lot of talking. Um uh well, I guess for me, in my condition with the chair, like I don't have the best hand function. So, and I'm, a, I'm left-handed now. I went from being right-handed to left-handed. So when it comes to like writing and stuff, I need a certain type of pen or pencil in order to be able to write and make it legible. So for me, it would definitely have to be when it comes to like using my hands. Yeah. And Audra, to your point, one of the things that I find personally challenging with the ADA, and I understand why it is the way that it is, I understand the intent behind it, but it is very difficult for employers, in my, to my thinking, um, to ask the questions they really want to ask without it being a legal jeopardy thing for them. In other words, Employers may have questions about how I'm going to do certain things, but they can't really ask that question legally. And I, 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 I in preparation for this, I spoke to a friend of mine who uh, works for a university out of state who is on the search committee for a lot of their positions in their department. And, you know, basically all you're really allowed to ask is, do you have any um, concerns or things that I should know about your ability to do this job? And that leaves a lot of the, I would say the onus, and this is my personal opinion, I'm just gonna tell you. It means that I have to basically try to figure out what your concerns might be as the employer and to address them without knowing what they are. And I'm not psychic. And so, yes, I can tell you what I think my challenges might be in doing a particular job and what accommodations I might need, but I, I don't know necessarily what the interviewer is thinking might be a barrier that may not be a barrier, but it's sort of awkward because we're, you know, we're not allowed to have that conversation unless I bring it up and I'm not psychic. So I'll be honest, it's tough. And, um, we, when I was in, in college, and I, I'd be interested in Fred's take on this as well. When I was in college, what we were told and what we're still told is you shouldn't mention um, be, being a person with a disability unless it's relevant to your work experience or relevant to the job you're applying for. It maybe makes you an asset because you're going to work in a field where firsthand knowledge is important. And I get that. 
But when I was 20, I felt really weird about, well, what happens when I walk in and they look up and realize that I'm blind and they didn't know that and now they feel a little caught off guard. Um, as I've gotten older, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more confident because I have a resume behind me, right? Like I've, I've worked for over 20 years, 25 years. So now I've got a track record, but as a new employee, it was tough. I didn't know what to do. And, um, I usually didn't mention it because I was told I wouldn't get an interview if, 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 if I did, but it makes it a challenge when you get there, because again, it's up to me to figure out what your concerns might be. And that's a little challenging. Fred, do you have any thoughts on that? Hi, Alicia, can you see me now? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Brad, yeah, that question is a fantastic question. Um, it's really, really, if you can imagine um, deaf people who cannot speak and only use sign language and they show up for an interview, you know, how is that accommodation going to happen when you can't communicate? Um, so, you know, sometimes, you know, deaf people will say, I'll need an interpreter for the interview. And most places are too scared to do that or, ooh, you know, not sure how to handle it, but they do not give an interview or, you know, or we just show up and they say, well, and then we think, well, we have deaf empowerment. We want to try to go ahead with the interview. It is not easy. It is very difficult because the communication is the barrier. So, but there are agencies that will work uh, with us and are willing to hire people that are disabled and we'll bring in an interpreter for access to communication. And we work with the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. Um, they have a deaf um, service um, support service department, and they will come and help with the interview. They will make sure they will talk with the agency on how to um, prep for the interview and work with the interpreter. They will train the uh, employer on how to work with deaf people. And that's a really great advantage that we have. And we, we are happy to help provide that. And we are happy to train. And we also train deaf people on how to handle an interview. So, I mean, that is a huge challenge um, with hiring because, you know, it doesn't say that on the, on the application, you know, um, if, if you, you don't really want to disclose about the disability, but, you know, for myself and my experience, when I would go to interviews, I just felt like I could, I was able to provide the accommodations and, or I would ask for accommodations. I would set up a video phone or I would try to, um, have communication access. So that the employer felt like, oh, you know, this is easy and not a problem to hire a deaf person. And a lot of times people just don't know or they, they're not educated on it. And so we don't mind doing that. And that is a challenge. It is a challenge for deaf people to get jobs because of the interview. That's the biggest barrier right there at the beginning. You know, when we show up and then they can't communicate and they just dismiss us. And unfortunately, that is still happening in the world today. Always a good perspective. Um, we are at that time. And unfortunately, I know all of us probably could talk about this subject a lot. Um, <laughs> it, I, what I will put forward from my perspective is if you have questions that we did not get to today, or you have concerns that come up after we leave, if you will email them to me, um, if somebody, I've got the screen reader off so it doesn't talk in your ear. If somebody can put my email address in the chat, um, I would be happy to either address them or forward them to our panelists who uh, would be, you know, I'm sure happy to, to give you answers or to work with you on some of this stuff. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attendance today, and I hope that you learned a lot from us. Um, I certainly want to thank our panelists, Fred Miller and Chantiel Black, for, for joining me. Um, I, I feel like this was a good conversation. Certainly more could be said and we may have future conversations, um, but I, I do really appreciate the time and the opportunity to present some information. Wonderful. Thank you, Brad. Before we go, yeah. I'm going to throw up the, the uh, survey. Yes. Then we'll and take we a have a poll. Show. Take a moment, answer the questions, and the recording will be shared next week. And it can also be accessed 
accessed by our um, United Way YouTube uh, channel as well. And if you're not a fan of our United Way uh, YouTube channel, please do so. That's the best way to find all of our DEI and other training uh, reporting. All right, well, I'm gonna end the poll. It looks like excellent is definitely the, 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 um, the consensus. So thank you, everyone. All right. Well, have a wonderful Friday afternoon and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brad and Fred and Chantilly. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.